da ruke bodo ve šanovnega pana Romana Lerka za možljivost vlaštovati v Tofoviti, v čemu prividnemu i elegantnemu premiščenju. Do predstavljanja dopovidača in prevedenja večera ja poprošu višnjoho člena naukovo teorista Imene Ševčenka, člena direkciji in profesora ukrinjšku literaturi Torontonjskoho univerzitetu, dr. Teresa Kuznaško. Šanovni panji in panove, srednji imamo prejemnost poslukati dopoveď dr. Johana Saremi, ukrajinista in fahivca z shidno in centralno evropejsko istorije, kot rej zdobu svoju doktorsko stupin v 2000 roci v Univerziteti Helsinki v Havazi svetovoji istorije z vidznakojem. Jeho desertacija Vyšča osvita in nacionalna identičnost Polska studentska dejalnost v Rosijski imperiji mež 1832 rokom, odrazu napisle povstanja, in 1863 rokom, na predodnji veliko nastupno povstanje. Ca kniha, ca desertacija bola nadrukovana, vyšla kneškovo v 2000 roku. Krim toho, Dr. Remi je avtorom ešte dvoch knižok Pohľad v ukrajinskoj istórii finskoj umovoju na dobi 300 storinok. Takže my teper môžeme byť pevni, že finská publika, ktorá zacikávať sa v Ukrajinu, má dočerpať znania pro našu spáščenu. Jak ja už zhádala moja prezentácia, vyšla okrem mojej knižkoj. I ostatnia knieżka Bratia czy Wrogi, Brothers or Enemies, Ukraiński nacjonalny ruch w Rosyjskiej Imperii od 40-tych roku, w 80-tych roku. Można powiedzieć, że to no, po suci, to jest wyczerpna monografia, jaka prodowżuje, jaka zaczyna się od aresztu Karola Antoniewskiego Towarzystwa i dowodzi tę historyczną kanwu na bazie czeslennych historycznych, archiwnych i literaturnych dżereł do početki duže hromade i širšeho nacionalnega ruku v Rosijski Ukrajini. Prof. Remi je docentom Shidnoevropejske istorije Univerzitetu Helsinki. In je takož avtorom rjadu statej na tematiku vid orfografičnih debatev v ukrajinski kulturi peršeg desetelji 19. veku, do zavolom ukrajinstva, valujevsko cirkularu, cenzure i v ostanji roke, nas kaj je razumijo, dr. Remi takož zvrtajo svojo uvahu do 20. stoletja, z okrema pro politiku centralne urade, teritorijalni sklad Ukrajine in što bi bovalo se v dobu Ukrajinske revolucije 1917. roku. Dr. Remi vykladal v rjadi univerzitete v Evropi in na tom kontinenti. V Varšavi, v Jorkskom univerzitete, v univerzitete Carlton v Otavi, v St. Thomas univerzitete v Fredericton. Vim takož studijoval in provadal dosličenje, jak doslednik imeni Evgena i Dejno Škerim v Harvardskom ukrajinskom posvičnom institutu. Odže imamo pred nami dure cikavi spisok dosjavnih zaslug in bez daljših zvolikanj. Hoču predati slovo dr. Johana Sorelji. Especially in the beginning of the 1860s. 
Uh, then I will speak about Tarash Chenko's two funerals and then something about what the elementary textbooks which were published at the time um, wrote about Shevchenko and finally I uh, tell just few anecdotal details about uh, the importance of Shevchenko during these years. Uh, most of what I speak today is based on my book, uh, but I would like to um, warn you that uh, my t today's lecture gives uh, much more uh, idyllic uh, <coughs> image of the situation of the Ukrainian national <coughs> movement than the whole book, because uh, today I will not speak about repressions against the Ukrainian movement, but there is plenty of them uh, in the book. Uh, this is because uh, these years, uh, from 1860 to 1863, were indeed remarkable, because uh, possibly the Ukrainian movement was, uh, had more liberty to act uh, at that time than, uh, than uh, at any other period of the 19th century, either before or after. After the suppression of the Society of St. Cyril and St. Methodius in 1847, Ukrainian cultural activism did not cease in the Russian Empire. To be sure, uh, Cyril and Methodians themselves uh, were not able to publish anything in Ukrainian anymore uh, before before Nicholas I died in 1855. However, there were other authors. Ukrainian literature in general was not forbidden. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the regime change in 1855 was very important and uh, it soon led to substantial increase in the opportunities for Ukrainian activities. <coughs> Censorship was relaxed and most political prison prisoners released, including those Cyril Methodians who were still serving their sentences in one way or another, like Shevchenko in the army in what is now Kazakhstan and Mikola Kostumarov in exile in Sarato. Uh, publishing in Ukrainian expanded and reached its peak in the early 1860s. From 1860 to 1863, 98 books in Ukrainian were published in the Russian Empire. And of them, uh, 68, approximately two-thirds, can arguably be identified as directed, intended uh, for distribution among the common people, on the basis of their size and price. <coughs> In all, their circulation reached tens of thousands. According to the correspondence from Poltava, which was published in the journal Asnova, and contained rather detailed information and looks reliable, more than 12,000 books in Ukrainian were distributed in the province of Poltava in the period from January to October 1861. If this information is reliable, I would say that the most conservative estimate of uh, distribution in general during this period from 1860 to 1863 in all of uh, Ukraine which belonged to Russia would be at least 30,000. Poltava was perhaps the most active in this, but not necessary. In Kiev, people were also very active. and probably more than 30,000. Uh, Taras Shevchenko's works were included in this dissemination of Ukrainian literary language and identity. The new Kobzar was published in 1860, financed by <coughs> the wealthy businessman Platon Simirenko and printed by Panteleman Kulish. However, because of its size, 245 pages, this book was out of reach for many peasants and other not wealthy readers. Uh, however, from 
1860 to 1862, several small booklets appeared, which each included only one Shevchenko's work. Hamalia, uh, Salmi Davidovi, and Tarasovanich and Topolia. The last two in two editions, in 1860 and 1862. And of these, especially Taras Vanich, contains rather clear national message. These publications belong to the remarkable series of small books which Danilo Kamenetsky, director of Pantele von Kulish printing press in St. Petersburg, launched at his own expense. Other similar publications contain works by Kulish, Anne Barbinok, Oleksa Storozhenko, Marko Vovchok, and Grigori Kvitka Osmavianenko. Uh, also, elementary instructional literature was in these years published for the common people, including primers, some history, mathematics, basics of natural science, and uh, basic orthodox religious works in Ukrainian. As we know, Shevchenko also himself wrote a primer which appeared shortly before his death in 1861, and its print run was 10,000. A group of Ukrainian activists in Kharkiv sent 6,000 copies to Arseny, metropolitan of Kiev. However, Arseny refused this donation after having uh, consulted in the matter with the censorship authorities, who advised him that uh, although the books are permitted, they should not be promoted, in order not to promote at the same time a separate little Russian identity like they said. These activities and the existence of Asnova indicate as well the strength of the Ukrainian movement at this time as the related tolerance of the government regarding Ukrainian activities, especially compared, compared to the earlier periods and the period after the Valuya Directive in 1863. To be sure, the authorities at first hesitated in their position regarding cheap and small booklets in Ukraine, but then decided to permit them in 1860. The, peri the period with the, with the window of opportunity for such publishing was rather short, about three years, 1860-1863, but Ukrainian activists exploited it to the full. Such publishing activities were possible because in several places Ukrainian activists were organized in local Romada groups. This existed at least in St. Petersburg, Kiev, Poltava, Chernihiv, Kharkiv and Moscow. The opportunities for action varied substantially from province to province depending on the policy of local authorities. Uh, where is in Kiev in 1860-62, Governor General Ilarion, Ilarionovich Vasilchikov wanted to use Ukrainians as a counterforce to the Polish movement for independence. In Poltava, the governor Alexander Pavlovich Volkov actively repressed the local formata. Ukrainian movement at this time was not merely cultural but also political. This is quite clear to anyone who reads Asnova or many other Ukrainian publications from the beginning of the 1860s. Asnova proposed a federation of Russia, Ukraine and Poland. Of course, it could not write this fully explicitly. But the message was clear enough. It was presented in the editorial in the context of a discussion of the Treaty of Hadiach, as presented in Nikolas Kostomarov's work. In this way, Asnova was able to promote the idea of a federation even under censorship. To give another example of allusions to politics in lawfully published and censored publications, Alexander Stroni published a primer in Poltava in 1861, <laughs> and uh, this, in this primer exercises began with the word Bolia. Behind the closed doors, within the Ukrainian circles, the debates were more radical. Although the Ukrainian movement as a whole cannot be called revolutionary, it overlapped with the all-Russian revolutionary movement. 
In discussions within the Ukrainian circles, both federation and full independence of Ukraine were proposed. In my materials, full independence was mentioned four times, plus once merely separation of Ukraine from Russia, without specifying what kind of arrangement would replace the imperial connection. To be sure, most often the independence was discussed as a possibility in undetermined future. Volodymyr Antonovich's political position is a good example of how the long-term political goals and short-term tactical considerations often led to different conclusions. Antonovich was prepared to cooperate with Governor General Vasilchikov against the Polish movement, but in a text directed to the Romada members, he wrote about Ukraine's right to independence in future. In the early 1861, Antonovich was questioned by the authorities who did not, however, arrest him. Under in interrogation, he spoke quite frankly about his Ukrainian, or as it is expressed in the records, South Russian convictions, emphasizing his opposition to the Polish movement in Ukraine. In his final report to Vasilchikov, the investigating commission evaluated positively Antonovich's orientation, proposing that he and his group should write articles about their ideas in periodical press and joined to the work of the Archaeographic Commission in Kiev. This was a government body which had as its task gathering and publication of historical documents with a political motive of demonstrating that the region was not Polish. The investigative commission's proposal is behind Antonovich articles in Asnova, especially his famous My Confession. And after this incident, uh, for somewhat less than two years, Vasilchikov was rather favorable to the Ukrainian movement. However, uh, it, this does not mean that other uh, imperial authorities were. He was somewhat uh, alone in his policy, which applied only in the area which belonged to his jurisdiction, uh, right bank, Ukraine. <coughs> uh, just to tell one example, <coughs> In 1861, a student, Yevhen Mosakovsky, was arrested for having, uh, he taught uh, at military school in Kiev, where uh, soldiers' children uh, received their basic education. And he had uh, <coughs> mixed socially with some of his uh, pupils outside the classes and spoke to them uh, both rather revolutionary ideas in general and, uh, and about the uh, Ukrainian cause. And he was arrested and uh, pretty much uh, illegal literature was found. Uh, it included Shevchenko's son and other other forbidden works by Shevchenko. When Vasilchikov reported this incident to St. Petersburg, Petersburg, he struck out all Ukrainian specifics from the case, so that uh, the authorities who read his report in St. Petersburg did not get any clue that there had been a Ukrainian aspect in this incident. <coughs> Uh, speaking about Antonovich, if this were all, Antonovich would look like an imperial loyalist. However, this is not all. In June 1862, an officer, Andrei Krasovsky, was arrested near Kiev for an attempt to agitate soldiers to refuse to suppress peasant unrest by force. Among the materials which were found in Krasovsky's possession, there were handwritten journals, Samostaine Slovo and Hromadnitsya which circulated within the Kiev Romada. The first of these journals, Samostan Slovo, included an article, The Relationship Between Russians and Muscovites, written by a pseudonymous author, Volodar, under which name Antonovich was later, in the 1870s at least, known in Ukrainian circles. The author evaluated negatively the historical role of the Russian government in Ukraine. It had destroyed the ancient rights of Ukrainians, suppressed all free thinking, introduced autocracy, and it constantly oppressed the common people through taxation and recruitment to the army. 
However, the author estimated favorably Russian radicals like Alexander Herzen and the group which was formed around the journal Savremenik, uh, Russian radicals. Russian radicals understood that our nation, uh, quote, our nation is not by right swept under their government, that it has the right to flourish in freedom now, and that in future it has the right to independence. End of quote. Of course, and unfortunately, this was perhaps a too optimistic perception of Russian radicals, but the remark about future in independence is nevertheless noteworthy. Also, Pantelemon Kulish presented independence as a possibility in future in a private letter in 1858. This was found before me by uh, Russian historian Alexei Miller. Uh, Petro Yatimenko proposed a toast to Ukrainian independence in 1859. The fourth time independence was mentioned in a letter by an unidentified author to Stepan Nis in Chernihiv. The authorities seized the letter when they arrested Nis in 1863. In this letter, the independence is mentioned as desirable, but hardly a realistic possibility. Remarkable is also Viktor Loboda's text, uh, which the authorities seized in 1862 when they arrested him. Quote, One or the other, state or liberty, there is no reason to be tempted by the status of a member of a large state. Such a country as Russia is unimaginable as free. Only despotism can keep together in the same conditions all those differences between a Finn and Tatar, a Muscovite and Ukrainian. In a free state, the majority decides everything. That is again Muscovite dom domination. End of quote. To sum up, the Ukrainian movement was not merely cultural in the beginning of the 1860s, but very much political. It strove to reach common people through cheap literature in Ukrainian, both fiction and non-fiction. Russian imperial authorities were not paranoid when they perceived the movement as a challenge to the existing social and political order. To be sure, their response restrictions on publishing based on language was both inadequate and uh, unfair. Uh, The very first issue of Asnova began immediately after the introductory editorial with Shevchenko's poetry, which continued to be published in most later issues. So Shevchenko was uh, <coughs> constantly read and constantly spoken about in the movement. He was one of the most important building blocks of Ukrainian identity. The first poem was Nedia Lude in Nedia Slavi, dated in 1848, Orsk Fortress, and thus emphasis was placed on the poet's suffering for the Ukrainian cause. The second issue, which indeed appeared only in March 1861, began with the news of Shevchenko's death, uh, my own perhaps somewhat pedestrian translation uh, from Russian. Ukraine responds by moan to the terrible news of the death of our father. That's how everyone is accustomed to call Taras. In him, she, Anna, meaning Ukraine, lost her most burning heart, her glory, her sorrow and joy, her illness and health. Now Ukraine is really a widow and orphan, poor orphan, Nebola, like he called her in his works which are forever young, full of boundless love and melancholy. End of quote. Further, Asnova connected Shevchenko's death with the abolition of serfdom, regretting that he did not live to see it, and announced additional publications of Shevchenko's works and memoirs about him. This included much previously unpublished poetry and Shevchenko's diary. The diary somewhat contrasted with the patriotic pathos in, commemora in commemoration of Shevchenko. For it was written in Russian, and in some passages the poet revealed his affiliation to Russian with Russian culture, like when he called Mihail Lermontov our great writer. By this observation, I do not intend to belittle the fact that uh, exclusively Ukrainian identity is prominent in many other Shevchenko's works. In its third issue, Asnova published. Lev Zemchurnikov's article, which contained, mem contained memoirs about Shevchenko 
and description of his first funeral in St. Petersburg on February 28, 1861, old style. The description contained in full the speeches at the funeral. Uh, Zemchushnikov continued the topic of Shevchenko as the father of Ukraine and Ukraine as Shevchenko's child. The motto was taken from a folk song. Oh Rajev ya ditya moye, to tebe stati, poriado tati, ale syra mohila dveri zale hlad, okonečka zakletila. Shevchenko's death was immediately used for political purposes, not only in the sense of creation of a national hero, but even as a commentary to contemporary events. The funeral had to some extent Panslav character. There was a speech by a poor student Vladislav Horoshkevich, who wished for removal of enmity between Poles and Ukrainians. This was coherent with Asnova's political orientation uh, to Slavic Federation. In his speech, Pantelemon Polish emphasized how Shevchenko did not die in an alien land, but in his own, because it was a Slavic land. So St. Petersburg was also part of Shevchenko's fatherland, like all, all Slavdom. Also, Mikola Kostomarov emphasized how great Russians valued Shevchenko's work. However, on the other hand, Kulish announced the plan to transport Shevchenko's body to Ukraine to a place on Dnipro, as he had written in Zapovit, Yakub Ruto Povovaite. And indeed, Afanasyev Chushbinsky spoke after Kulish, reading his own poem for the event, in which he stated that Shevchenko indeed died in an alien land. <laughs> so contrasting with Kulish and Kostomarov. Uh, thus, the idea to move Shevchenko's body to Ukraine emerged immediately after his death. As Sergei Yetelchik has observed, since peasants were so central <coughs> in Ukrainian national mythology at the time, it was most appropriate to establish a national sacred place, not in a city, but in countryside. Not that everyone agreed. Kiev Romada activists demanded that Shevchenko should be buried in a Christian cemetery in Kiev. Even when Shevchenko's body was brought to Kiev, there was as yet no consensus about the place where it should be buried. Finally, the opinion of St. Petersburg, Ukrainian activists there, prevailed over that of Kiev. Shevchenko's friend, artist Rihori Czestahivsky, even invented an argument that Shevchenko on his deathbed had expressed his wish to be buried in Kanin. This was not true, and Czestahivsky had not been present when Shevchenko died. Uh, on May 8, 8 Shevchenko was buried on Chernetsa Hill. The authorities observed the event, Shevchenko's second funeral near Kanin without attempting to prevent it or without interfering in it. According to their report, uh, 2,000 people attended the funeral. This is a remarkable indication of Ukrainian movement's potential at this time. Uh, especially taking into account that uh, the public arrived from some distance, not necessarily from very far away, but in any case, uh, most were not <coughs> locals. They came at least from Kiev, if not from uh, more far away. <coughs> and any Russian political group at the time was not <coughs> able to mobilize as many people. Uh, very often in uh, works in historiography about uh, Russian revolutionary movement and opposition uh, to autocracy, the student demonstrations of the fall 1861 are in St. Petersburg and other cities are mentioned as kind of a turning point because they are public demonstrations against government policy. However, in St. Petersburg, uh, according to students' own announcement, uh, there were 900 persons on, on street. So, I, in general, I find skepticism concerning uh, 
the Ukrainian movement's potential and, and its actual mo mobilizing power uh, in, at this time uh, not guaranteed. Although it is of course true that, uh, that the movement was only emerging as yet. It, later it grew even more. <coughs> Shevchenko's importance was one of the central ideas which Ukrainian activists wanted to transmit to peasants. Without exaggeration, one can say that the authors wanted their readers to know two facts. What is Ukraine and who is Taras Shevchenko? To be sure, uh, what is Ukraine was told uh, much through uh, Cossack history. Cossacks and Shevchenko are the two topics which uh, repeat themselves in elementary textbooks to the common people. So, uh, 14 instructional textbooks in Ukrainian were published in these years. They included seven primers, two books on mathematics, two on religion, one on natural science, one on history, and one that explained the emancipation to the peasants. Ukrainian national activists wrote and published most of these books, and often they tried to transmit their own values to readers or listeners. All the primers mentioned the Cossacks. And all except one mentioned Shevchenko. However, the silence of the textbooks regarding Russia and Russians was remarkable. Only two primers mentioned this country and its people. we have here is a rather typical example. Ilya Derkach, Ukrainska Framatka, appeared in Moscow in 1861. Uh, it's interesting where it is printed. It's printed uh, in uh, Katkov's typography in Moscow, and rather soon after this, uh, Katko, uh, the editor of uh, Moskovsky Vedomosti, I think. What was his journal? No, well, that is not important. Uh, he became arch enemy of, uh, of Ukrainians and uh, agitated for full ban of Ukrainian literature. But just shortly before he provided his, he did business with Ukrainians, pro providing his typography to their use. And we see that on the very first page, there is a quotation from Shevchenko. Let's write this to Oslova. The first literary text which follows in the lesson seven is also from Shevchenko. And they follow Shevchenko's translation of a psalm. Likewise, other similar books like Kalinik Shekovsky's Domastia Nauka. On the cover page, there is a motto from Shevchenko Uchisya Serdenko, Kolis Nash Budutlu Lude. The most representative is Leonid Yashenko's book here, which I would like to show you. It's the one which is in the web. It's open on that point. Not in this file, but Ramatka Zadlia Ukrainsko Lud.
On the color page, we see again Nietzsche's Toho Slova, Shomati Spivala, etc. And most remarkable here is the poem Narizbo, with even the date and place given, course around 1848. The author, Leonid Yashchenko, a Moscow student, could not write in a primer about Shevchenko's sentence and service in the army, but he clearly expected that teachers would tell about them to their pupils. And the poems are followed by Shevchenko's short biography. Taras napisam ne duže bahato, za te kožne jeho slovo pala široju ljubovju do rivnoj Ukrajini i do ukrajinskoho prostoriju. This lesson about Shevchenko is followed by another Desho pro Ukrajino, which concentrates in the Cossack history, even mentioning the destruction of Zaporizhia Sich by Catherine II in a neutral tone, but nevertheless mentioning. And our final example is Alexander Konisky's Arithmetica Abo Shotnitsya Dla Ukrainsky Shkil. St. Petersburg, 1863. Uh, on page 23, we, found an, we find an exercise. Ukrainian poet Taras Khyorovich Shevchenko was born on the 25th of July 1861 and died on the 26th of Skilti hodin vin prožin na svinti. The authorities' documents contain three interesting incidents related to Shevchenko's importance for Ukrainians. First of them, in a, some, is a, in a somewhat surprising place, Moscow. Uh, the most extreme all-Russian radical group of these years, Young Russia, or Pyotr Zajchnevsky's group, began as a clandestine publishing venture of forbidden books, especially uh, ones which criticized religion, Christianity in particular, and religion in general. Uh, the group was uncovered in June 1861, but this did not prevent its members from writing a bloodthirsty proclamation, Young Russia, while they were in detention. It, it appeared in, a, next, in the next year, 1862, illegally, of course. The proclamation condemned private property, religion altogether, uh, marriage, and in general, uh, these young guys wanted to turn the world upside down. Leonid Yashchenko, whose primer we have looked at, was a member of this group. <clears throat> Among its failed publishing attempts was printing of Shevchenko's works. Printing failed, and the result was not deemed satisfactory, either the text was not legible or, or just it was so ugly and hard to read, that, uh, that uh, the group rejected the result, but they had no time to, to try again, because they were arrested. This was the last uh, attempt <laughs> at printing what they did, and so this, this Shevchenko's uh, forbidden um, poetry by Moscow students did not reach public. In 1862, well, this is interesting, the case in that the Russian radical students are so open-minded about Shevchenko. Probably the situation would have been different after some 20 or 30 years, but at this time they just took everything what what was in opposition to the government, probably uh, proposed by Yashchenko, who had strong Ukrainian identity. 
1862, the censors in Kiel rejected Pauli Schwenczitsky's manuscript in memory of Taras Shevchenko. Now, Schwenczitsky was a Pole. He belonged to, to the same Polish Ukrainophile group to which Antonovich and Tadej Rilski originally belonged to. But uh, unlike they, he remained in the Polish movement and participated in the Polish insurrection in 1863. Um, his manuscript uh, in commemoration of Shevchenko was rejected on the basis that uh, there were too many complaints about Ukraine's present situation and uh, uh, there were unclear expectations about the improvement in that situation and the excessive price in general lavished on Shevchenko. So here we have uh, another <coughs> example in another direction. We have the Russian students printing Shevchenko, we have a Polish uh, student uh, writing about Shevchenko, but uh, censorship did not permit this. Uh, by the way, this is the only uh, <coughs> manuscript in Ukrainian in 1862 submitted by the Pope to keep censorship, which did not prevent the Valuyev Directive to claim that the majority of such works in Ukrainian were submitted by Poles. That was a lie. <coughs> And finally, let us go somewhat uh, more forward in time. In 1876, immediately after the restrictions on Ukrainian literature were reenacted and reinforced in the Ems Decree, St. Petersburg Journal and uh, Shevchenko's acquaintance. Uh, the journal was called Chola. Mikhail Osipovich Mikeshin appealed to the main administration of the press, the central uh, all imperial body of censorship. About the local censor's decision concerning his two Russian language articles on Shevchenko. The censor had suppressed several passages and Mikeshin was especially upset about the passage in which uh, the words in his homeland, Ukraine, uh, one uh, word, Ukraine, was dropped <laughs> and only retained in his homeland. Mikeshin found this decision arbitrary since Shevchenko's Ukrainian origin was a widely known fact and it made no sense whatsoever to suppress it. However, in response to Mikeshin's appeal, the Council of the Main Administration of the Press banned the articles altogether and instructed censors not to permit any texts about Shevchenko. And their argument uh, why this uh, was that they referred to the Ems Decree, although uh, the Ems Decree uh, spoke only about publications in Ukraine. There was nothing about what can be written in Russian. But nevertheless, this was used. Ban on mentioning Shevchenko was uh, argued on the basis of the Ems Decree. So, as George Grabovich has written, Shevchenko's cult 
has very little to do with literature, although Shevchenko is a good writer. Uh, in the very beginning of the national agitation, when the nationally oriented intelligentsia began to propagate their ideas to the larger public, they wanted their readers to learn about Shevchenko in the process of learning literacy. By the time of his death, Shevchenko was one of the building blocks of Ukrainian identity, and the imperial authorities also were able to identify him as such. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. One is uh, the booklets that you mentioned that were published for the common population in Ukraine, were they accessible in Western Ukraine, Galicia? Um, I have to be ashamed and, and answer that I do not know. Uh, surprisingly, the, the other way, some Galician publications I came across, which circulated in uh, Ukraine under Russia, but they were really not many. Just a couple, couple of them. Uh, but about these, these uh, print, uh, publications printed in Russia, I don't know whether they were exported. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this one concerns Finland. To what extent is uh, Shevchenko known in Finland? Are there translations of? any of his works into Finnish. He is known to some extent. There are no translations. Um, those who know something about Ukraine, and for unsurprising reasons, uh, the quantity of such people has increased in recent years. They usually know about Shevchenko. The general public, uh, not so much, but at least people nowadays no more uh, confuse Ukraine and Russia with each other, like they did before 2014. Um, Thank you very much for your informative talk. Uh, thank you very much for your collaboration with me and that. My question is somewhat in, in follow-up to Professor Bedeckis. Uh, <clears throat> the fact of uh, the flourishing of Ukrainian studies in, in North America was largely uh, with the association of, of the, the historical fact of the Cold War. And you mentioned events since 2014, but you, you began your studies earlier. I was wondering if uh, in Finland and also in Scandinavia, is there a, an increasing interest in, in Ukrainian studies as a result of Putin's policy? In Sweden, there are quite a few people who, who, who research Ukrainian history. In Finland, Unfortunately, I don't know anyone except myself, and even I do not know him there, although I write there, published there. Uh, may I ask you uh, whether you would mind telling us how you became interested in Ukraine and in Ukrainian studies? Uh, through twists and turns. Um, Actually, I do have some Ukrainian background, although I have uh, understood it only recently. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, one of my parents uh, belonged to tiny Russian minority in in Finland, and uh, and and other of my parents uh, was a pure Finnish person, and. Uh, I grew up in a somewhat uh, schizophrenic and uh, I, nowadays I might say even first perverse uh, <laughs> atmosphere uh, without sexual allusions. Uh, I got my dose of the Soviet patriotism, although I lived in Finland in, in childhood. And uh, I knew my grandfather who was from Taganrog. He died when I was 13. Um, but we never discussed uh, any, these kind of ideas, and I, uh, I was always told that my background in in this line is Russian. But now recently, I looked at the uh, Taganrog district's uh, results in 1897 uh, imperial census, and indeed that district had a majority of Ukrainian speakers. Um, and then I suddenly realized, why is it that my father always spoke "shaw" and it "shto"? <laughs> okay, but <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, in any case, uh, my grandfather. Uh, fought for in, in the White Army during the Russian Civil War. So he had no Ukrainian identity except perhaps in, a, in some vague regional sense. How I, I became interested in, uh, at first uh, in Russia in general, and I understood that it was an empire, I became interested in Poles. When I studied uh, the Polish students for my doctoral dissertation, I was uh, fascinated by Kiev. Ukrainian people who were Ukrainian activists who were originally Poles, and this resembled a, a bit uh, a similar movement in Finland, uh, quite at the same time, where people switched from Swedish identity to Finnish identity. Although the political context, there are great differences in that because this switch in Finland was promoted by the government where his uh, Ukrainian identity was, as a rule, not promoted in the Russian Empire, as we know. And so I, I wanted to, to get deep, deeper into this, and so I came to Ukrainian studies. Um, I would say that through my dissertation, in about 2000, when the dissertation came out, I made the decision to, to research Ukrainian history, and I have remained in it pretty much. Thank you. Ukrainian moment. Polish students' movement. Did you meet the name of Joseph Bopre, poet of the war? Учасник польського повстання 1831 року, народився в містечку Гвіздець Коломийського району, це Галичина, Івано-Франківщина, там, де я народився. І ще одне прізвище – Домінік Магнушевський, учасник польського повстання 1831 року, теж поет і воїн, він похований на Гвіздецькому старому цвинтарі. У містечку, де я народився. Дякую. Can you repeat the second? Другий? Домінік Магнушевський. 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 Хай буде гей. The thing is, there were very many polls in various universities. Their proportion was greatest in Kiev. But, Practically no Poles from outside the Russian Empire uh, came to study. 
Why there were so many Poles at universities? Was because university, universities in Warsaw and Vilnius or Vilna uh, were closed at that time, and so it was the most practical way to hire higher education for uh, Polish youth who <coughs> lived in the Russian Empire to study at Russian universities. But uh, it's a small wonder that Russian universities, although by the 60s, uh, some of them were quite good depending on, on the field, uh, did not attract Poles from outside the Russian Empire. I'd, I'd like to put a philosophical question, that a friendly challenge that revolves around our understanding of what we take to be politics. In, in your talk today and in your book, you emphasize that the Ukrainian movement in the middle of the 19th century was more political if we can put it that way, than we generally assume it to be. That is, you challenge one of the prevailing mm -hmm. views of this. And I, I want to explore that challenge because I'm probably on the other side. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, everything's political. That is, choice of religion is political. The, the world we live in today, our, our Facebook likes are political. But if we take politics to be a deliberate attempt to influence government policy, to change how society is structured, how government operates. And in particular, if we look at the Polish uprising, particularly the Polish uprising of 63, and the Ukrainian not non-participation in it, isn't it fair to say that the Ukrainians really concentrated on a different kind of politics. That is, the politics of the Ukrainian movement really was directed at education, at influencing public opinion, at creating an atmosphere from which a real political movement could build, rather than actually influencing political events. I am disappointed because I have to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, this, uh, like for instance, uh, talk about independence. It was mainly placed in undetermined future. It was thought about, and it was uh, for some people and probably for many more people than uh, we know from our sources. It was mm, a goal, but it was a distant goal, and it was not to, that they wanted to go with uh, weapons against the government in order to uh, put, put this uh, into practice, but they uh, rather chose these uh, booklets, cheap booklets, uh, and they foresaw a long period before that would be realizable. Then, in other instances, there, was some, uh, there were some attempts to influence the government just by lobbying. And that, uh, about that, actually, there's perhaps too little in my book. But, uh, but those were uh, as appropriate for an autocratic political system. Those were uh, one question at a time, like permitting, permitting use of Ukrainian in uh, the first and second year of study <coughs> at ele elementary schools. Very many Ukrainians uh, kind of passively sympathized with the revolutionaries in general. They were not friends of the political system, but they were not going to challenge it themselves, most of them, some, some of them. If I could just follow up, one of the reasons I posed the question, and I'm interested in your response to this, is because it always seems to me that the politicization of the Ukrainian movement is as much a result of government repression as it is as of the growth of the movement itself. That is, had the government not repressed this movement as forcefully as it did, it may have stayed a cultural and social phenomenon that didn't transform into a political movement. Now, because that did not happen, we are on a free space where we can uh, think 
everyone <laughs> would rather. What we want, uh, I find it unlikely that the uh, absence of uh, absence of repression would have um, made the Ukrainian mov movement politically more moderate, perhaps in a very short time period. But its potential for political subversion in, in terms of uh, Imperial Russia, it was there all the time, I would say. And uh, I find it unlikely that Ukrainian activists would have adopted such a, such orientation like they did in the Habsburg Empire, where they were rather loyal at the same time they patriots of their own country. There were too many obstacles for that because especially the need to distance oneself from Russians uh, in order to build Ukrainian identity. It existed uh, quite regardless of the government policy. Yes. Uh, I have a question. In your talk, you mentioned uh, attacks of uh, Suchenko's funerals and uh, its role on the Ukrainian cultural movement. Uh, to what degree, if at all, was Shevchenko himself involved in that movement in the last years of his life after his return to St. Petersburg? He was, at that time, if we think about his uh, personal participation. I would say that he participated, but he was not among the most prominent participants. I have a question about the Ukrainian language from Africa Primary, that you mentioned in the other publications. Uh, who were they directed at? Were they directed at Ukrainians living in Russia, or were they brought back to Ukraine? Were they trying to spread them amongst the peasants? Did they sell this idea of Shevchenko being spread mostly among city folk or directed to peasants in liberation and then that. Where were they headed? The, the were, they all, were they all published in Moscow or were some of them published in Kiev or elsewhere? Yeah. Uh, many were published in Kiev by this time and, uh, and those which were published like in Moscow, the idea was that they would be transported and distributed in Ukraine. Of course, uh, some local intelligentsia may, may have just simply bought these books, but then it did not, they did not have much to offer for people who already were educated. They really contained rather elementary knowledge. And um, these books were actively distributed. They were both sold and uh, and also distributed for free, just. Uh, often it happened that uh, Ukrainian activists bought themselves a certain amount of them and then distributed for free to peasants. Occasionally, uh, some people bought very many copies. Like Polish, Polish work was supported by some wealthy noblemen, but it's not that they read these books. They, they were then distributed among peasants. What were the print runs? Was it the largest of them or the smallest of them? Uh, largest, what I know, is uh, 10,000, and it's uh, it's Shevchenko's uh, prime. Um, it was exceptional. I think uh, more often. The, uh, the, there's only sporadic information about the print run, but I think uh, more often it was uh, in the range between 500 and perhaps 2,000. That's a quick question, segue to that. Uh, what was the literacy among the peasants that you said this was exclusive? We're well, not exclusive, but primarily I mean, for that population. So they, how about the good they understand the problem? What was the literacy rate? That is an interesting question. Um, 
there's no quite, there's not no fully reliable information about that, but it was probably less than 10%. Less than 10. Yeah, at this time. It substantially increased towards the end of the century, but uh, the thing is that uh, uh, the government undertook educational efforts only after the emancipation uh, of uh, serfs. Before that, it was uh, all the education the peasants gained was mainly based on their own interest or, or local initiative of local educated people, but the government was not interested in, in it as a rule. This does not mean that uh, uh, literate, literate peasant was a rarity. No, not necessary. And Shevchenko <laughs> right. was literate, and he was not the only one, definitely. <laughs> 10% is not that little. You have several literate uh, farmers, peasants in every village who could read. It's not bad. I have a question that's a bit off topic and it concerns the Poles who became Ukrainians in Kiev, like you mentioned. And the knowledge and the first Reisky. Mm. That's an unusual thing. As I understand it, Kiev was not the Ukrainian speaking city then, was it? Mm. And uh, what was it that sent them to be Ukrainians rather than Russians if they wanted to make a career in that state? I think careeristic uh, motivations, if, if they existed, they were most likely secondary. Because if you want to make a career, you, uh, you become Russian and not Ukrainian. Uh, however, this choice was forced on these people by the imminent uh, insurrection. And this was a kind of uh, it, it demanded, it's true that it demanded less sacrifice from the activists than participating in the insurrection and either getting killed or uh, spending the rest of your life in Siberia. <laughs> Kiev, I think, was in a sense Ukrainian city at this time. There were many languages there uh, among the local nobility. Poles, Poles were very prominent, Polish was spoken in Kiev, Russian was spoken by part of the nobility and, of, and uh, practically all, all of the authorities and uh, bureaucracy. But uh, Ukrainians at this time still, I think, formed a majority of uh, craftsmen in the city. And of course, it also had many Jews at this time who spoke, many of them spoke Yiddish. In Kiev? Yes, or originally, originally, I think they were no, not so certain, on a so certain ground because uh, this is not what I am prepared <laughs> for today. But I think uh, they were in principle forbidden to live in Kiev until 1840s and then permitted. And, and this community increased uh, quite fast. And it was still on a precarious ground because it depended on the interpretation of the existing regulations. Uh, so their presence was somewhat illegal but tolerated. And, ah. I have a question about the Ramada societies at that time, uh, particularly the ones outside ethnic Ukraine or the, the Ukrainian governors. Um, you've obviously done a lot of archival research, I know that. Did you find lists of members of these Ramada societies? Do you know how many members they had at that time? Um, 
and sort of a, a question connected to that is, were, were they just in, in Petersburg and, and, and Moscow, or were there also in other Russian cities? Um, in Russia, I don't know about other Ukrainian groups except in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, I may have found their membership lists, but uh, they are lists of names with little information. What are they? <laughs> and so they need some... But how many numbers? What is, what is the size? Um, tens, of ten. people, tens of people, more than ten, less than hundred. А якщо немає, то ще раз подякуємо нашому вечері і зверну вашу увагу, що при виході ви ще можете купити книжку за підціни Brothers or Enemies і дістати автограф. Через дякую.